Hello everyone, good evening, or maybe not good evening, uh, if you're not in the chat, <laughs> you might be watching this, who knows when. Um, but we're back uh, here for finishing up um, our topic on affirmative action. Uh, we have a little bit left over from Hedinger, because I pulled the plug early last Thursday, I was so tired. Um, so we got a couple more things to talk about from Hedinger's paper, two last arguments that he considers. And then we're going to look um, uh, at Pojman, and Pojman's going to be kind of on the other side of this. So... Uh, let's finish up Hedinger. It's actually not going to be that bad of a transition because the last arguments that we left uh, from Thursday were the arguments that Hedinger called legitimate objections. And what he means by that is that these are arguments and concerns that he thinks actually do hold some weight. All the other objections we were looking at in the last lecture were things that Hedinger thought were spurious. He called them spurious, meaning that he thought that um, while they might look like they have something morally legitimate to offer that would challenge the moral legitimacy of affirmative action, he thinks under analysis that kind of evaporates. But with these legitimate objections, he's saying, yeah, that there is, a, there is a problem here. There is a kind of concern about affirmative action that is relevant and has some weight to it. What he is still going to say, though, is that these objections are not deal breakers for affirmative action. Um, they're things that we should do what we can to uh, minimize uh, these these moral concerns if we can. But with the stuff that we can't minimize, um, the the benefits, the things that are sort of the positive arguments on behalf of affirmative action, how again, how it, how Hedinger believes that it can lead us into an equal opportunity future, that it can help accelerate our development toward a actually equal society that those um, justify these sorts of moral mm, concerns about it. And he's going to try to um, not just sort of you know, dismiss them, but actually give us some arguments by analogy about why we really should be okay with this, um, because we're okay with other situations that involve similar costs. Um, so that's, that's going to be kind of the basic mode for both of these objections, about how Hedinger, what he thinks of these objections and how he's going to try to respond to them. Um, so let's uh, let's get with this first one. Judging on the basis of involuntary characteristics. Oh, and actually, I kind of misspoke a second ago. Um, I was saying Hedinger thinks that um, affirmative action policies would be justified in terms of accelerating a um, move toward equality. That's actually, I was just preparing with Pojman. That's more Pojman's language, actually. Hedinger never really talks about that. Instead, Hedinger uses a slightly different um, uh, tack. He says um, that actually he believes affirmative action policies would be a necessary way to get to a more equal future. So just to, just to anticipate Pojman a little bit, Pojman thinks that we're kind of moving in the direction of equality. He doesn't believe that we're out of the woods yet. I mean, he's, he's not defending that kind of view like the thing that we were talking about here um, at the uh, in the the end of the lecture on Thursday, this last argument before the section on legitimate objections, um, Hedinger doesn't doesn't really buy that. I he I think and if we wanted to flesh out like where might he be coming from on that, I think what Hedinger has in mind is that these um, these past uh, injustices, um, these past um, prejudicial elements, have sort of skewed the game in favor of um, white males and against these sort of um, uh, disenfranchised demographics. I was using that term last time. Um, and I think he thinks, why would you expect any sort of power redistribution to happen, like automatically, um, that those kinds of advantages are going to be hung on to, people will continue to fight for them and, uh, and retain them. Um, they can't use the same kinds of uh, methods as before, perhaps, like sl don't have slavery anymore, um, to kind of perpetuate them. But um, there is another concern about, like, how is this going to just happen naturally or automatically? Even with the law changing, like we were saying in the last lecture, even with the law changing, that didn't solve everything right away. That didn't just suddenly make us into an equal and just society because we had a law that said so. There's still those aftershocks. There's still that legacy of inequality in terms of the opportunities people have available to them and the sort of privileges that they um, get to use in the competition for jobs. 
and other social goods. Okay, so um, yeah, I shouldn't have I shouldn't have said that one phrase. Hedinger actually is on a very different tack than Pojman on this stuff. Okay, so let's look at this. Judging on the basis of involuntary characteristics. So Hedinger acknowledges that hiring decisions that are based on reverse discrimination cause us to treat people in ways that are sensitive to factors about them that are outside of their control. Like we're, we're selecting for people, we are discriminating about who to hire based on variables that people can't do something about. I can't get an operation and become black. Like that's not going to happen. Um, so that might have a problem for individual autonomy, um, Hedinger says. Now we need to kind of figure out why would that be true. We need to, so like I say, let's hash it out. Let's try to cash out what is the basis of a moral concern here. Um, so think about um, think about this kind of example. Let's say you come to me. I've got jobs. I'm a manager of some company. Um, and I've got job uh, opportunities, and you're looking to get a job. And you come to me with your application and everything, and I say, well, we can't hire you, sorry. We're looking for someone who can do you know, these things, and you're not able to do that. Now, if the hiring decision is based on those kinds of qualifications, then there's usually something you can do about this. There's some way in which you could... Um, increase your uh, qualifications. You could go and get some more education. You could go get some more ed um, uh, experience um, in other jobs. You might be able to pick up a certification for the thing that I need for this position. And then you can come back to me and sort of say, hey, look, I got all these things. Um, now can you hire me, right? So the fact that my hiring decision is based on factors that are, to a certain extent, within people's control is a way of giving them more space for agency. If I'm looking for something for this job position that you can't change about yourself, that's an involuntary characteristic about yourself, um, then you don't really have any choices. Um, and so uh, you have less space for expressing your autonomy. And this is a really important little distinction because this isn't like, it, this might sound like Kant, and that would be a correct assumption to make, that this concern about autonomy stems from moral theories like Kant's, um, respecting people's ability to be self-determinating and all that sort of stuff. And to not to, to hire based on involuntary characteristics doesn't violate your autonomy. It doesn't um, stop you from being free in a sort of Kantian way, um, how Kant would describe that. But it does sort of have um, something that might be problematic about it. If we care about autonomy, if that's a deep, central, foundational moral value, a grounding for a metaphysics of morals, as Kant put it, then maybe that's going to inform these other sorts of areas and give us some guidance on, you know, if we have a choice between this, should we judge based on voluntary or involuntary characteristics? It would be more morally ideal to judge on voluntary characteristics rather than involuntary ones. Giving people a space for them to express their agency and their innate power of self-determination, that would be a good thing, and to not give them that space would be a problematic thing. Okay, so um, that's this kind of uh, idea about how affirmative action is a threat to autonomy. Well, it's not a direct threat, but it definitely is problematized. And I think that's what Hedinger means here when I, when I say in my lecture notes here, um, that he thinks this argument only shows that treating people on the basis of involuntary characteristics is only morally undesirable and not something morally unjust. If you wanted to make that extra step, you'd have to really put the pieces together um, to make that argument. I think Hedinger is probably right about that. Um, but I do say, you know, we could, we could try to think about this a little bit more. Would maybe Kant have any resources to help with this? Um, can uh, and actually, it might be even easier to see whether where there might be a Kantian concern when we look at some of the things that Hedinger is going to get into for his way of replying to this objection. So I, I think there might be room for thinking about this more deeply than Hedinger does. That's usually the case with philosophers. Um, I'm I, I'm giving a big philosophy talk at Bellevue College uh, tomorrow, actually, um, and I, I've been putting together the presentation, and I'm like, cool it, Tim, like. You can't say everything. <laughs> You've got 50 minutes and just be honest about like, 
you know, do what you can in that space, but don't think like you're going to answer all the possible objections or something like that. That might be good advice for your paper too. I mean, sometimes I've had some students who are thinking about all the possible objections and it can be very overwhelming um, to because you're not going to be able to lock down everything, but maybe you can make a contribution to get a little bit further. And we might say, yeah, thanks Hedinger for your work and let's take it further because maybe that needs to happen. But thanks for the, um, thanks for the well wishes, Tanya. I, I will probably need some luck with this one. It's a very ambitious talk and uh, I clocked myself this afternoon on a trial run and I have 50 minutes and I was at like 46 minutes and that was without, that was just like cruising. So I hope I can get through everything and I hope it makes sense and people enjoy it. Okay, so that's the concern about this argument. Oh, thanks, Lu Ling. <laughs> um, here's Hedinger's reply. So again, remember, Hedinger is putting this objection in the category of things that he thinks have legitimate concern to them. Um, so he is not trying to say this is nothing. He's like, yeah, you know, I respect that. That's a good point. That is a concern about affirmative action. It's something that makes it less than ideal. But his reply is to say, well, hey, this kind of discrimination happens all the time. And this isn't a two wrongs fallacy kind of situation. It's not like um, if someone accuses you of something wrong and you say, well, you do it too, so you can't hold me accountable. That's a fallacy. That's a bad way of arguing. I don't think Hedinger is doing that here. I don't think he's saying, well, hey, we do it in other cases. So he's really making an argument from analogy. Let's see how this works here. So he says, um, people, uh, are, the system that we have that is sort of the common practice of a meritocratic basis of h making hiring decisions, like whoever is most qualified kind of thing, um, is usually justified on the grounds um, that we're trying to increase efficiency and or utility, right? To understand that efficiency in terms of utility. So certain people, just because of their genetic situation, again, something that is not within their control, they might not get, they might get passed over for certain things. Um, a good example of this would be being an astronaut. Like you, uh, there are certain biological things that are genetic that might just keep you from being able to be an astronaut um, that might stop you from that. And there's some reasons for that. And we think of those as legitimate reasons. Um, and Hedinger's not saying that that's innately problematic here. Um, you remember, he was sort of sympathetic with some of the efficiency considerations back in some of the earlier arguments we were looking at, especially the one about um, hiring doctors and what kind of care would that give to patients, right? This, this is something that he doesn't think is morally irrelevant. So he's not saying that's a problem or that's an evil. That's why this is not a two wrongs fallacy. What he's saying is this, if we're comfortable um, judging people on involuntary characteristics when the goal is efficiency or utility or, or just say profit, he's sort of saying, how much more so would it be justified to do this sort of thing for the sake of creating a just society? If affirmative action can really do what it promises and help us to have a society of, of truly equal opportunity for everybody, then that is, that's a worthy goal, just the same as efficiency or profit or economic efficiency would be, right? So um, he thinks if you had to um, like choose between creating better consequences or treating people with justice, that's going to that's gonna win out every time. So if we're cool with it for efficiency, all the more would we be cool with it for the sake of social justice. He's going to use a very similar argument in the next uh, objection, too, in response. Um, but that's, that's Hedinger's way of replying to this concern. He's like, yep, that's a real concern, but we can still argue that this is still morally justified despite that moral concern, and here's an argument from analogy to prove it. Uh, chat, how's this going? Did that make sense? I think this is a little, it gets, these two arguments are a little complicated, so I want to check in. Okay, you think so? Not 100%. Okay, um, maybe, do you have any particular questions or certain steps of that that were a little fuzzy? Was it more about the initial concern or the way that Hedinger is trying to respond to it? Or both? Okay. Okay, so... So um, we think it's morally undesirable 
to treat people on the basis of involuntary characteristics, things that they didn't have any choice over, like what sex you're born as, what race that you are, things like that. We don't, we don't decide those sorts of things for ourselves. And what Henger is saying is that in a meritocracy, if we're going to make hiring decisions, if we're going to give opportunities to people based on uh, their qualifications, well, some of those qualifications come down to these involuntary characteristics. A person's genetics might um, influence whether they're capable of being hired for a certain type of job. And the reason being is that not because we're just like, bias towards people with better genetics or something like that it's when those characteristics have something to do with efficiency about who's going to be able to do the job the best sort of thing like which will increase the most profits or generate um, the most efficient use of resources that will sort of produce the most good consequences overall we want to give those positions to people who can do that but that might mean judging people based on characteristics that are not within their concern under their control which was the concern of the original objection about affirmative action and Henger's saying that's okay that's all fine like he's actually used he, he wants that to be okay um, that we do find that morally acceptable to make an argument from analogy for affirmative action doing the same sort of thing if affirmative action is judging people based on involuntary characteristics um, that could be okay if there's something else here at stake that would outweigh that concern in these normal cases of meritocratic hiring practices, the concern is efficiency. And that would justify why we're going to judge people based on factors outside of their control. Um, we're sort of asking pe certain people in society that have unfortunate ge genetics to kind of like take one for the team for the sake of overall efficiency. Um, and Henger's saying, well, if that's true for the sake of efficiency, it should be all the more justified to judge based on involuntary characteristics, something that's not morally ideal, if it's for the sake of creating a more just society. Um, remember that Hedinger's whole whole game here for trying to justify affirmative action was on the grounds that affirmative action can create a more just future, um, a future for society that has true equality to it. That That's the whole goal. It's all forward-looking, right? So if affirmative action policies can do that, then even if they have this morally undesirable element, they can still be justified, since we're cool with that for the sake of efficiency. Is that any better? I, I kind of said a lot of the same things again, but is that helping? Uh, either one of you. <laughs> okay. 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 All right. So that, that same kind of argument from analogy of like, look, we're cool with this for the sake of efficiency. So we should be cool with this for the sake of social justice. That's the kind of argument that he's going to make in the next objection too. So um, maybe seeing it in a, about a sort of slightly different context will help with this one as well because they're basically the same point. Okay, here's a, here's the second legitimate concern that Hedinger thinks we might have about affirmative action. That it burdens white males. Um, it, it places a kind of social burden on white males without compensating them for it. So here's the concern. Um, in the efforts to create this egalitarian society, this just future through a policy of affirmative action, there are costs. And those costs are shouldered by job seeking white males that aren't compensated for it. So the the charge of the concern here is that this is unfair and unjust. Okay. Now Hendry, I don't think he's gonna go maybe not quite that far, but he thinks there is something morally concerning about this situation. Basically affirmative action means turning away certain white males that are the most qualified for a position that's available. And that would, if there wasn't affirmative action, if there wasn't this kind of hiring policy, they would get the job. So we're sort of like taking the job opportunity away from them, and we're not doing anything to compensate them for this. Um, we're trying to um, work toward this more egalitarian future, and in order to do that, you know, someone's going to not get the job, and it's going to be people who are qualified for it. So they're being asked to sort of carry a social 
uh, cost, kind of like taxes. Uh, it's like an extra kind of tax, maybe. <laughs> I sound like Friedman when I say that, but um, that might be the concern of the opponent here. And Hedinger's going to say, first off, he's going to clarify his position and remind us that he doesn't think that something like reverse discrimination or affirmative action is justified either because white males deserve those burdens as a kind of punishment, like that they've done something morally wrong by having privilege and so they need to be beat down for that. Uh, it's not like that. And it's not, Hedinger also isn't trying to argue for affirmative action on the grounds that uh, they that we need to compensate disenfranchised demographics for um, these sort of past injustices. It's not a reparations type of situation. Instead, again, Hedinger is thinking of equality as a social good, uh, that justice in society is a good that um, is very important and we would need that we should be willing to pay the cost for um, that it'd be something worth doing um, <clears throat> and the uh, imposed part I think is important because uh, like imposing this cost on white males because um, Hedinger is trying to say that you know if white males elected to bear this social cost well that would be that'd be awesome and people sometimes want to argue that social good uh, shouldn't be something forced onto people. But Hedinger's being like, no, I think that's totally fine. I think it's okay to force it. He's definitely, he's not trying to take the easy out here of saying, well, it would just be the right thing to do. And so white males should, should like re relinquish their positions or something for the sake of, of getting other people um, in on the game, giving them opportunities too, to make this better, uh, uh, more equal future. Um, he's saying that even if they don't do it, if he, even if they don't elect to do it voluntarily, that it would be legitimate to impose it on them. And he brings up a, a little analogy here from another philosopher named Thomas Nagel, who actually wrote a couple papers that are, are er, really early on in affirmative action um, that were kind of seen as influential. Um, well, not super early on, but, but still in the, in the 80s when there, there was sort of more and more philosophical discussion starting to happen around this. Um, so Nagel talks about a, this highway. A city wants to build a highway. That's a social good. Like Seattle has terrible traffic. So let's say we wanted to kind of, uh, the city wanted to alleviate that. So they're like, well, we need to put in a new highway here or light rail or something like that. And there's this law of uh, imminent domain that basically the state, can say, uh, so you've got this land, that's where we want to build the highway, you've got your house there, you live there, something like that, uh, we're going to take that land, and um, we're going to compensate you for it, okay, but it's not like the city is punishing these people by taking their land away, I mean, even with the compensation, it sucks, right, it is annoying to have to move, you've got your home built there, and now the state is just like, yep, we're taking this, this is ours, People can appeal this stuff, of course, um, but the the state has this kind of authority to do this kind of thing. Um, that if they're like, look, this is what city planning needs, then they've they've got some legal space to do that. And it, and it sucked to be in the way to be to have your home taken from you like that. I mean, you are given compensation, um, so it's not like you're just suddenly made homeless by the state or something. That would be totally unjust. Um, but usually there is a kind of cost here because. You know, the city would send out a, um, a surveyor to figure out what the value of your property is and, and pay you for that. But you might be able to, if you're selling it on the market, maybe you can get someone to pay for more um, than what the house is, is sort of um, evaluated at uh, as being worth, right? Maybe you could get some more money. So you wouldn't have that opportunity if the, uh, if the city just kind of took it and compensated you for it. But this is um, this is nothing personal. Uh, as Nagel puts it, like, why do people have to suffer for the social good? Not because they deserve it. It's just an accidental. They're just in the way. And this is what Hedinger kind of wants to say about the way in which white males are being treated. Um, that they're kind of just in the way of this sort of social justice. It's nothing personal about them. It's not like they don't have rights. Um, they do have rights. They deserve to be treated equally like everyone else. As Hedger's already argued, they have a more than equal opportunity, right? 
but um it's not like they need to be downtrodden or something like that there doesn't have to be anything negative here it's nothing personal to them they're in the way of this kind of social good though and so they're going to take on this kind of cost um, now Henger says um, you know this would be there is something to this objection too that there'd be a concern about this but it's usually uh, a serious objection only if the burden is a substantial one so if society is putting a really extreme burden onto someone like if it meant that a white male was going to be unemployed if they just were going to be unemployable because of the affirmative action policies then we'd have a big problem that that were a bigger problem that would be uh, uh definitely a difficulty i think it would also be fair to ask about like well what about everyone else who's not able to get em uh, get employment either right and what happens to them probably definitely matters too um but uh Hedinger says in most cases this isn't actually that big of a burden so like if if a white male who's highly qualified, someone who's the most qualified for some kind of business position, then they're going to be able to find a job somewhere. It's not like they're going to be homeless. It's not like they're going to be unemployed and out on their luck. Um, so the biggest thing that Hedinger thinks might happen to them is that they just have to apply to some more positions um, or they may not get the, the dream job that they wanted or something like that. They might have to settle for something less than that. But that's not so substantial of a burden that there's a big problem for not compensating them. That's one thing, um, but he does. Hedinger is willing to grant that. Look, if if there is a kind of um, cost that some are going to bear here, let's try to spread that out as much as possible. Um, maybe not uh, put those the burden on poor white males, people who are already like in a lower social status um, because of their poverty. Um, there might be some more ethical ways, more ideal ways to impose the cost of this social burden for the sake of this social good this kind of goal of justice um, so there is um, there's another response though that Hedinger makes it's very similar to his response to the past argument uh, argument that he says you know if we just take a look at this society is in the habit of not compensating people for costs that they bear for the social good again going back to the meritocratic hiring practices of businesses so people get turned down for jobs all the time because of efficiency concerns um, and that does have an interest in the social good in fact Pojman is going to make that exact argument in his paper that hiring the most qualified person is not just just in his opinion he thinks it's also uh, maximizing good consequences that it would be justified on a kind of utilitarian grounds um, that society benefits by having the most qualified people in these positions so in the same fashion as last time if we're okay saying I know you really want this job this is something you'd really like to do but look for the sake of the social good of maximizing good consequences of efficiency we're gonna say you don't get that opportunity to work that job um, that's a that's a social burden that's put onto that person and we don't compensate people for that we just don't and maybe we should do it more um, there are uh, there are some social programs that the government has or there's welfare programs to try to help minimize these costs uh, in terms of human suffering um, but there are these these things are asked of people all the time so Henger is like we shouldn't suddenly with both of these two objections Henger is kind of saying look if you want to like take a look at affirmative action shine the spotlight on it put all the scrutiny on it um, and then say like "Ooh, look at these little moral problems in it you know you got to kind of take a look around and be like well, if we're going to complain about it here, then we got to change a lot of things <laughs> elsewhere. And if we think we shouldn't change those things, then we have to keep that in mind in contextualizing the weight that these um, problematic elements of affirmative action have when we're evaluating affirmative action directly. Um, I think Hedinger's main argument is that, look, the, the, the kind of goal here, the goal of social justice, of true equality, is something that we all care about. And we don't care about it in an insignificant sort of way. It's it's some it's definitely a, we could say a core American value, um, and to have people having um, unfair advantages um, that they don't really deserve, um, that's not based on their effort um, or what they put into it. I mean, that's what we we don't we don't want that situation. We that that's not what it means to. Uh, 
uh, live a life of dignity in, a, in just American culture, like all the kinds of values of justice that we stand for. So if we want to make, if we want to put the money where our mouth is, if we want to make ourselves into a society that really reflects the values that we say our society is founded on, then it's, we should be willing to pay some costs for this, that it'd be worth doing. And Hendra thinks that uh, this might be a necessary step. Again, he doesn't think affirmative action is going to solve all these problems automatically. But he definitely sees it as a pretty essential tool in the tool belt. That's what I said last time. Um, so that's Hedinger's kind of position here. Um, and that's about all I really want to say about Hedinger. Um, and I'm eager to kind of move on to Pojman so we can get through all the things that Pojman wants to talk about too. And there's a lot. But how are we doing in the chat? Um, any kind of leftover hanging threads with Hedinger? Either from last time or from this time. Cool. All right. All right. Um, just to be in, in the interest of like transparency and full disclosure, um, I, I definitely uh, personally, personally, <laughs> as a philosopher, I am much more sympathetic with Henger's position than with Pojman's. In fact, I disagree with Pojman about quite a lot of things. And as a sort of transition of getting into Pojman, um, I think it's fair to say that you know, as a student of philosophy, you're not always going to read positions that you like. You're not always going to agree with what everyone says. And that's that's a part of what it means to be a truth seeker. And I want you to be keeping that in mind when you're working on your papers because of how important it is to me that you um, integrate your opponents into the conversation to represent their arguments against your views and against your position, um, to take them seriously, and then to actually try to shoulder the the burden of proof to respond to their concerns as best you can. So that's definitely reflected here personally for me in this conversation. Um, some of the things that Pojman says just like <clears throat> make me cringe. Um, and I'm happy to be honest and transparent about that. But just as it's true as a student of philosophy that you're not always going to read or study people that you like and they're still important to read, same thing as a teacher. When I'm teaching a class, um, I think it's my responsibility to not just share the stuff that I think is great or that I agree with or something like that. But to give you an idea of what are sort of all the arguments that get thrown around in the discussion. So um, I will be presenting Pojman uh, as charitably as I can. Uh, I will try not to comment too much about the things I don't like. But there's definitely rooms for – there's definitely a lot of room for disagreement. Same thing with Hedinger. Um, I think I mentioned in my last lecture that uh, – I can turn this back around. Um, it's uh, it's sort of been hard to decide which one to do first. You know, do Pojman first and then Hedinger or Hedinger and then Pojman. It's kind of hard. Um, I kind of like doing Hedinger first. I think he kind of sets things up a little bit better maybe. But because um, Pojman also leaves certain things out of his uh, presentation of affirmative action that are in some ways less than charitable to it. Um, not quite fair. But there's a lot of this interesting room for uh, conversation and debate between the two of them. So like after going through Pojman, it wouldn't hurt to look back at Hedinger and be like, how are these guys going to like talk to each other? Because um, they definitely have some places where they have arguments to use back and forth on each other to kind of criticize each other. And this is a controversy. I mean, the debate over affirmative action is, is not a slam dunk sort of thing. Um, it's definitely problematized. Um, and like I was saying at the beginning of my lecture on Thursday, I mean, I took this from Pojman. Um, beginning of Pojman's paper, he's trying to remind us that people who are sincere, good, moral people, intelligent, thoughtful, informed, can disagree about these sorts of matters. Um, Pojman himself is not some, like, crotchety white guy who doesn't like equality or something like that. It's not by, not by any stretch of the imagination. Um, Louis Pojman... Um, was a part of the civil rights movement in the 60s. He was He's largely speaking a liberal, you could say. He, he was a protester, uh, anti-war protester against the Vietnam War. I mean, he's not someone who is hostile to the notion of equality or that we ought to create an egalitarian society. Um, he wants that. He just thinks affirmative action is not the right way to do it. And he's got some moral concerns about that. Um, now, that's not to say that all of his arguments are, you know, appropriate or effective or something like that, but just to kind of say that um, if we're looking at two sides of the debate, it's not like 
Hedinger, the progressive who cares about social justice. Pojman, the person who's a closet bigot or something who's trying to rationalize why we shouldn't care about egalitarianism. I mean, that's, that is not at all the debate that's happening here. Um, I wouldn't give you a paper like that. There are a couple things, uh, a couple arguments from Pojman that uh, I, I get personally a little worried could be misused by someone trying to rationalize uh, a lack of concern about egalitarianism or social justice. I, I could worry about some of his points being misused, but I don't think that he's doing something like that. I don't think he's trying to rationalize this stuff away. Um, I don't know the guy personally, so you know I can't speak with total authority on that. But the arguments that Pozeman's going to give um, are an attempt to ground this stuff in considerations of justice. And I've seen um, reflections of his arguments in disagreements today among people who have progressive um, values and who have a progressive vision of social justice. So, um, yeah, he's not uh, this is, he is not irrelevant. Um, even if I don't, if I don't agree with him about a lot of stuff. Um, okay. So, um, I'm going to kind of not rehearse all that stuff that he was saying at the very beginning, um, about sort of setting up and understanding this debate. He's got a bunch of definitions here. Um, and some of these are better and some of them are worse. Um, I've tried to fix a couple of them. There, there's actually, and I, I want to clarify something else here, sort of, again, um, just to make sure I, I don't get misunderstood. Um, there are there are some portions of Pojman's paper I list in my lecture notes where I'm like, I'm not sure what's going on here. Like, I'm, Some of his arguments are worded in a little bit of maybe a confusing sort of way or might seem to be making like suggestive points about stuff. I've tried, I'm going to try to clear this up as best I can and as charitably as I can uh, to try to do justice to um, what I think Pojman is is uh, attempting to argue, but there, if some of the arguments, if I've had some students in the past report to me that they were like reading Pojman and being like, wait, what? <laughs> like, what are you saying here? Um, and that there's definitely some opportunities to maybe misinterpret him in a way that would not be very charitable. So I'm, I'm going to try to help with that. Um, but my corrections are not a way of trying to, uh, you know, you know sort of criticize him or put some extra scrutiny on him that I didn't do on Hedinger or something like that. So I just want to clarify that. Uh, Li Ling, you said, how bad is Pozeman's point of view? I'm not sure what you mean by asking how bad is it. I mean, I'm not a moral authority about this. I mean, I want to make that clear. I just disagree with him about stuff. Um, yeah, I, po I've been trying to say that I think Pozeman is a sincere moral philosopher. I mean, he cares about the same values that um, Hedinger cares about. I mean, in terms of the goal that both of them, the vision or the ideal that they would have for society of what, what would be this kind of just society, I really think they've got the same vision. They have the same ultimate goal. What they disagree about is evaluating affirmative action as a way, as the means for trying to attain that goal. Of whether this is the right sort of response to a recognition of things that are true injustices that we got to do something about. Um, so that's the thing that they disagree about. That's why I was saying, like, it's not like Pojman doesn't think equality matters or something like that, um, or he's not an egalitarian. He is, and he actually put his money where his mouth was in his life. That's why I like to bring up that he's he was a civil rights activist and an anti-war activist and this sort of thing. Um, he's not this kind of academic sitting on the sidelines who's making intellectual excuses for things uh, for why we shouldn't do anything it's not something like that does that does that make sense Leeling? i mean when you were reading him did you think his his view was bad okay Here, while you're typing, I might add something else here that could be helpful. Um, so uh, when I say I disagree with Pojman, for example, um, you can respect people that you disagree with. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I disagree with him. Yeah. A lot. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on, on some more 
fundamentalist sort of things. Uh, yeah, that's true. But um, I, I kind of maybe it's just part of the culture today about disagreement, like the 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 kind of expectations we have, like that if if we, I mean something. <laughs> let me try to be as clear as I can. A lot of times you observe this sort of type of interaction or model for interaction take place in our society today. That if there's some matter of great importance that someone thinks somebody else has the wrong view of, then they think that that person is like a really bad person for having that kind of view or something like that. In my opinion, I believe, kind of like Pozeman was saying at the beginning of his paper, this is one thing I agree with him about, that you can have sincere, moral, people who actually really care about morality, um, intelligent, informed, thoughtful people disagree about really core matters of justice. That we can have very, very different ideas about these things. And it's not, bec it's not as though everyone who is sincere, thoughtful, open-minded, uh, reflective, um, informed, intelligent, all those things that I was listing are going to all arrive at the same conclusion. I do believe in the ideal that if we carry on these debates long enough or, and really dig into them, that we can work toward resolving those disagreements. But that's a theoretical ideal. And in the meantime, before we are able to actually demonstrate which position is rationally defensible, um, we can't try to jump the gun on that sort of thing and just dismiss people who we disagree with um, out of hand um, because we think this is too important of a matter or something like that. That's exactly what they feel about it too. And I think that's an important thing to remember. Um, I'm not saying that everyone who disagrees with you is a, a you know charitable, thoughtful, intelligent, sincere, morally concerned, you know, all this sort of stuff. Um, there are certainly people where I mean, not not being thoughtful, not being sincere, not being informed. Those things can really hurt your ability to get at the truth, um, or to make like to get better answers. That that definitely is a barrier. But just meeting all those sorts of conditions doesn't mean that you've got all the right answers. You can still be wrong. And we have to take that seriously, I think. And see, um, my advice, this is why my hat is still tilted, my advice is that um, we need to look for ways to have this conversation together and to sort out those differences. And that means having some patience with it. It means me teaching a paper that I don't necessarily agree with. Um, it means me trying to show the logic of his arguments when I would not want to defend them myself. I mean, that's what it can sometimes mean, or even just listening to something that you don't agree with. And I think that that's an important part of the process. Um, certainly, if the person is that you're talking with is being abusive or something like that, I'm not saying stick around and be a doormat for that. Um, there's certain limits to that. But like I said, looking for opportunities where we can have this debate sincerely and legitimately I think is really, really important. Um, we don't have to agree in order to work cooperatively together on trying to really work for justice, right? to work for truth. That was what the whole code of intellectual conduct was all about. Um, and I'm in danger of going on a really long rant about all that stuff again if I don't watch it. Um, but is this helping you, Li Ling? Are these comments kind of uh, helping set the context right here? Yes? Okay. Wonderful. Awesome. I'm happy to hear that it helps a lot. Okay. All right. So <clears throat> I, I can talk about that a lot more, um, and I probably want to, but I also, we have some things to do here uh, in the lecture, so I want to make sure we get through everything tonight. Okay. So getting into Pozeman proper. Um, Pozeman's paper like sets up a bunch of definitions early on here, and and some of these I think need to be like tweaked a little bit. Like I modify his definition of bias. I think what he says literally is a little misleading. So I do think Pozeman is not quite as careful on some matters than Hedinger is in terms of clarifying some things or making it clear how these arguments are supposed to function. You might have noticed like how fast some of the arguments happen, and it, they don't get cashed out maybe as much as at least as much as I might want. I I need to be careful that I'm not. Um, putting extra scrutiny just because I disagree with him. And that's always a danger. Bias is everywhere, and a true seeker always needs to be keeping a track on that. Um, but he, he has some useful things here. So he defines discrimination 
as just judging one thing to differ from another on the basis of some criteria. He says this is often good. Like you got to be discriminating. If you're hiring anybody using any standard or technique or criteria, you're being discriminatory. And that shouldn't be a bad word. In this way, Pojman and Hedinger are exactly on the same page when it comes to reverse discrimination as not being wrong just because it's discrimination. Um, that, that can't be a problem all by itself. Instead, discrimination has a problem, a moral problem with it, based on what we're discriminating about. And this is where he gets into prejudice. So um, Pojman wants to say that prejudice is a kind of discrimination that's based on irrelevant grounds. Now that might also not be the like tightest definition, philosophical definition we could give for it. I, I can imagine some things I might want to clarify about that, but that's how he's going to be thinking about it. <clears throat> and he, and I, and I think it's important to maybe say right now, um, this will definitely come up in Pojman's definition about equal opportunity, but Pojman really has this meritocratic vision in the back of his head. I think that helps you get inside his brain and why he's going to make a lot of the arguments that he, that he will. Um, that he really does think that the most deserving, the, the person who ought to get the job is the person who's most qualified for it, who's able to like compete for it the best. And we saw Henger talk a lot about that. And I think it's, it'd be fair to kind of look over Pojman and be like, why does he think that this is justified? And can that be defended against Hedinger's concerns? Again, back to how Hedinger and Pojman are definitely sort of button heads on stuff. And you could take their papers kind of side by side and have a little imaginary conversation and debate between the two of them. And that, that would be definitely in, uh, useful, I think, to do that. Um, and then he defines bias as a tendency toward one thing rather than another that, and this is why I changed it slightly, is based on non-rational factors. Um, and actually, that's pretty close to my favorite definition of bias that I use. I think I might have even brought it up before in our conversations, that I like to define bias as um, phenomenon of bias is, is just any a rational or irrational force that affects belief formation. So when we form the beliefs that we have, not on the basis of evidence, argument, and reasoning. That's what we're talking about with bias. Um, and then he wants to define equal opportunity as when everyone has a fair chance at the best positions that society has as at its disposal. Um, and this is, a, I think, uh, there's a little caveat in there that I think is somewhat interesting. Notice he says that they have a fair chance at the best positions. Um, I don't know if this is something that we want to restrict to the best positions, but definitely there's an idea here that some positions are better than others. And being able to sort of compete for or make an attempt at uh, improving your position in society is something that Pojman, um wants to see. Now he goes on to sort of cash this thing out a little bit and say um, that only aptitude and effort should be used as a criteria for who gets these positions. Um, but that doesn't necessarily need to be built into the idea of equal opportunity, although I mentioned in my lecture notes here, that's frequently what people have in mind, especially in America. America has a culture with very strong tendencies toward uh, meritocratic standards that we want to see reward go to the person who's the best at something. Um, that if that reward is given to someone who's not the best, then this feels like an issue of justice to us. And, and like I said, Pojman definitely has that going on too, I think. Now, it's interesting to note that aptitude and effort don't necessarily uh, overlap, right? Um, we saw that with Hedinger, that a lot of the things that we have aptitude for are not necessarily the things that are the direct result of our own efforts, right? Um, we may not deserve them the way that we deserve things that we put our effort into. So that might also be something worth thinking about for, for Pojman's definitions. But then he defines affirmative action directly, and there's some careful things here we need to keep track of. He says affirmative action is the effort to rectify the injustice of the past as well as to produce a situation closer to the ideal of equal opportunity by special policies like hiring policies okay so when he says um there's this kind of uh janus faced aspect to affirmative action he's talking about this backwards looking aspect and this forward looking aspect again keep in mind that 
um, Hedinger is doing something very different from this uh, in the sense that he's really only focusing on the forward looking stuff and not the backwards looking stuff. Poshman's going to address both, although less of the forward looking stuff, I think. I think he focuses a lot more on the backwards looking stuff. Um, Poshman also says that this kind of forward looking race consciousness is paradoxical. I question, is it really? But he says the basic point here is that we have to become race conscious in order to eliminate race consciousness. Okay, now the thing that I might challenge here, and I think I will, I'm not going to step in a ton like this on Poshman, but here I definitely want to. It's a real question about the vision about where we want to go here, about whether an equal future means being race blind, color blind, as sometimes people say, right? Should we try to be color? Is that what equality looks like, being color blind? Or not? Um, I definitely think that amongst, so this this is kind of something I might share with uh, Pojman a little bit of a concern about, um, that sometimes when we talk about uh, progressive ideas and visions of equality, we do have this kind of sometimes speaking out of two sides of our mouth. On the one hand, we're like, we're all the same, we're all equal, equal stuff, right? Um, that uh, we should not see these things, these barriers, these divisions between us of these different demographics that we occupy. We're all people, right? You see people talk about that. But then we also talk about the value of diversity and respecting these kinds of differences, cultural differences between people from these different groups. Um, so the kind of, that that might seem like it is intention. And I think uh, part of a responsible progressive philosophical theory or perspective would require a finding a way to make those things consistent with each other. And I think such a thing is possible. I don't think that those have to be sort of intention or dare say contradictory or as Bozeman puts it, paradoxical here. Um, it might be that um, becoming colorblind is not the goal that we're shooting for here. I don't necessarily think that Hedinger feels that way about it. I don't, I don't think he's as concerned with that. I think what he's concerned about is that we're no longer going to be treating people in unjust ways. Um, that would be the bigger problem. Leeling, you asked, um, affirmative action also applies to school selections, right? Yes. Um, I, that's definitely, Pojman's going to talk about that context for it. Um, I, th I think in the light of the law, that sort of thing um, is in play. For the context of business ethics, it doesn't necessarily need to show up. Okay, except if we start thinking about the role that businesses have in the broader project of social justice and asking, you know, where should this happen? Um, Pojman himself says we should be focused on equal opportunity initiatives like the kinds of things that affirmative action are doing. We should be working on trying to create a more just and equal society at stages that are earlier in people's lives rather than later, like where they go to college or what jobs they get. Um, but moving it earlier, I mean, Going from the business world to college would definitely be putting it a step back in time. Um, so, uh, so yeah, that's kind of a move in that direction. But um, affirmative action um, is a little different when we're talking about businesses versus colleges. I think that is there is a, a difference there. There are going to be some things that are parallel between it, though. Um, are you wondering whether Bellevue College has affirmative action? Um, uh, policies in how they select students. You know what? I'm not actually sure about that. I'm not uh, informed about that. Not to my knowledge, um, but I think it might be possible. Certainly what Bellevue College does have as a, as a stated goal is making education, uh, high quality education accessible to people who otherwise it wouldn't be accessible for. So I know that that's, that's an initiative. Um, Bellevue College, I don't think, has as much of a mission statement around um, bringing only the very best students that we can possibly get into the college. Um, it, this is, we're, we're from the model of a community college of where like people can just go and take classes. If you wanna make yourself you know, more educated on something, you can do that. That's the original idea of a community college. Um, so the um, application processes are not as strict as going to like high-powered research universities or Ivy Leagues or something like that. In fact, um, when 
BC was thinking about doing this merger thing uh, a couple years back uh, with Eastern. I think it was Eastern. <clears throat> um, this was a concern that I had. No, not with UW. Um, I was concerned about uh, whether we were going to be betraying our mission there because they've got more of that kind of focus at Eastern. Oh, are you wondering, does UW have affirmative action policies? Not... Oh, no, no, no. The, the merger was not going to be with UW. No. No. I think it was with, I think it was supposed to be with Eastern. Yeah, but that's, that's all, that's been, that plan's been scrapped. <laughs> and I kind of think that's a good thing. Um, okay, so, where was I? Ba -ba 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 -ba. Okay, we were talking about race consciousness. Oh, that's right. Um, so, uh, Pochman also has this distinction between weak versus strong affirmative action policies. So the weak one is still like Hedinger's idea of the tiebreaker between people with equal qualifications. Um, but Postman's right to think that um, there are some other things about affirmative action um, that don't just look like, you know, when you're in, you're making the judgment call who to hire. Uh, some big things about it is uh, about how companies in terms of their hiring policies might take active steps to promote equality is to be really um, mindful about where they're advertising their jobs, how people become uh, aware that these jobs are available, um, how they're able to apply for them, whether there's certain like steps that they would need to go through um, to be able to apply that might make it a barrier for certain people from coming from certain demographical backgrounds. Um, certainly, I mean, if a company just like only advertises itself to white males, there's a problem. They can be like, hey, we'll hire anyone. But if, I mean, you're kind of like setting up the solution if only some people even know that a job is available. Uh, so that there's definitely some other weak forms of affirmative action that are not as controversial. That's more like, yeah, duh. Yeah, let's do that. There's no real moral problem with that. And it, it is, it does seem to be on grounds of justice to require companies to do this sort of stuff. To, to equally advertise their jobs everywhere, to make them open. Certainly, um, the, uh, what is it, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 uh, prohibits explicitly as illegal those kinds of practices to discriminate on, like, being like, yeah, we're not going to consider anyone who comes from a certain race uh, or has a certain sex or something like that. That's not, that, that is positively, elite, positively illegal. Um, but the strong version is the real interesting one, right? That's the one that's more controversial. That's the one that Hedinger wanted to defend. And that's the one that Pozeman's going to focus on too as the issue of controversy. So preferring uh, a candidate who comes from one of these disenfranchised demographics over a more qualified candidate. The one thing I do think that's important to note here about Pozeman's presentation of strong affirmative action is that he seems to see it happening almost entirely through a quota system and it doesn't have to work that way, um, especially the way that Hedinger sort of described it. I don't think Hedinger has quotas in mind. It's not like we need to have so many women in the office place or we've got a problem here of social justice. That's not the way that I think Hedinger is thinking about affirmative action hiring policies. It's sort of like it's another factor in deciding who you're going to hire. You're going to look at the person's qualifications, but also be like, hey, you know, if we gave this person this position, could we also do some social good here, too? Uh, could we advance um, these considerations of social justice? Um, it's not like we need to just make sure that we've got the right proportions of people, the token uh, hire, that kind of thing. Um, that would be important to sort of distinguish here. So quotas, I think, are potentially more morally objectionable um, than non-quota-based systems. And strong affirmative action doesn't mean signing up for quotas straight up. So that's an important thing to, to clarify. And then I think I'm, we're about ready, we're about halfway through, so we're almost ready for a break here. But before we take a little break, um, I do want to mention that there's all this history that Pozeman tries to kind of catch us up to speed on. Um, it's important to note that there's been a lot of history since Pozeman read, read, read this, uh, writ, uh, wrote this article. Um, I tried to clue you in on some of this stuff last in last lecture about just how... Um, uncertain the legal and constitutional basis of affirmative action for or against 
and the latest ruling from 2016 is sort of speaking more uh, from the Supreme Court uh, is speaking more in favor of the constitutionality and legality of affirmative action policies. Um, so I'd say the the needles sort of tipping more in that direction just in terms of the law. Um, but there there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, I'm okay. So I'll, this is another thing I, I want to throw a grain of salt in about. Um, I think Pojman is in some ways a little selective about his history, um, about what events he picks out um, that sort of support his case a little bit more. Um, so be aware of that. Uh, I I like I just say here like I'll just say this. Just imagine what someone who's coming from Hedinger's side would say in response to a lot of these cases. Um, there is some ways in which some of this stuff will come back later as a part of an argument. We'll talk about that later when we get there. But I don't plan to uh, lecture uh, in in detail on this section of the paper. Um, just you know, keep in mind that when it comes to history. Um, Sometimes we can have selective views of that, and it's important to look at a lot of different presentations of what that historical narrative looks like. Um, definitely the things that Pojman is bringing up are important pieces of the puzzle too, but there's some other things as well. Okay, um, so maybe now is a good time to take a break before we get into um, the arguments that Pojman considers. He's going to split up the paper here between arguments in favor of affirmative action that he's going to try to debunk, kind of like Hedinger did in his paper. And then also uh, looking at um, these positive reasons why we'd consider affirmative action to be inappropriate. Okay, so I'll take a short break. And we're back. Okay, so let's take a look at um, Pojman's arguments and the arguments he entertains from his opponents. And that's what the, going to be this first ca category. And I have a note in the lecture notes here where I say um, I'm going to omit the frequently mentioned arguments that strong affirmative action is unfair, as this is a separate argument and usually irrelevant to the consideration of whatever argument is at hand. So um, Pojman does have an argument directly for this idea, and we will take a look at that, but um, this is another sort of aspect that I'm a little dissatisfied with in Pojman, just, just as a philosopher, not whether I agree with his perspective or not, but sometimes he tosses that that phrase around in a, in a kind of... I guess I could say like sloppy way as this sort of like it speaks for itself instead of something that has to be like seriously focused on like say how Hedinger does that when he's saying like a fa failing to hire the most qualified person is unjust and he breaks that down in a number of different philosophical ways in which you could try to justify that um, I don't always see that same thing from Pojman that same care in delineating exactly exactly what the point is being made so he kind of throws it around everywhere like salt on everything <laughs> like any type of cooking you know you throw salt into um, so we want to be careful about that so I'm going to try to focus on the things that are distinct about these different arguments as we go okay so the first thing that Pojman talks about and this is really useful I think it, this fleshes out some stuff that Hedinger didn't uh, focus as explicitly on about just how does affirmative action actually help with these issues of creating a more just um, and equal society in the future one way you might try to argue for that is to say that there's a need for role models. So by putting, um, by giving these uh, jobs to people from these disenfranchised backgrounds, that that can be inspiring. I think I I, I mentioned this idea. Hedinger didn't uh, go about it directly, but I think I mentioned it in the Hedinger um, a lecture last week. Uh, I think I talked a little bit about um, some of the research that's been done with teachers that teachers that. Uh, that you can that a student can identify with that share that same kind of background. Um, there's increased uh, there's a there is a statistical correlation with increased success for students. So that might be a factor here uh, because of role models. And Postman has a couple responses to this. Um, the 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 second response is going to kind of get into the next argument a little bit too. But the first one he says is just he just asks, are they really all that necessary? Is it necessary to have role models that come from that uh, these certain backgrounds? Um, Pojman shares a personal anecdote about how he's been able to be inspired by people who don't come from his class back background or demographical background, um, and that other people could too. And I, I wonder a little bit about that, um, I, and I think you should too. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to spend a huge tangent here breaking down all of my objections to Pojman or the way I would push him around a little bit, as I said earlier. But I think that is worth 
thinking about. I mean, anytime a philosopher just offers a personal anecdote, that's not always um, a very strong argument just in and of itself, but we can think about like, does he have a point here? Um, is there, uh, how, how much weight should we put on that kind of role model? What if we had uh, people in these positions who were positively encouraging people from all backgrounds, like like teachers? Also, Pozeman's kind of coming more from the academic end of the spectrum on this. Uh, and the academic world's a little different than some parts of the business world uh, in terms of the opportunities for that kind of inspiration. Most people who are working jobs at corporations are not thinking about being inspiring to other people to help them have the confidence to succeed. Um, maybe they should, but they don't usually do that. Teachers, uh, that's on the radar a lot more, right? So that might be worth thinking about. But the other point he tries to make here in response to this argument is that he says we need patience to wait for quality role models. So in other words, like I was saying earlier that Hedinger doesn't necessarily have this going on, but Pozeman is thinking of affirmative action as trying to uh, jumpstart or speed up or accelerate this um movement of society that's heading in this trajectory toward equality and that we need to speed it up and he's like no we need to be patient about that that a role model if someone got the position because they really were the most qualified he thinks that's more inspiring than just seeing someone in a position if we know that they got it because of an affirmative action policy that that wouldn't be as inspiring um, and that goes into the next the next argument so another reason why affirmative action policies might be useful in working towards social justice is that we have a need for breaking stereotypes. So if you always see people in certain jobs that have a certain demographic background, then it's easy for it to just sort of be implicitly reinforced that that's a job that people from this demographic do and that other people don't. And we do see that kind of phenomenon happening. And I think Pozeman would say, yeah, that's a problem. Um, we do, I don't think he disagrees that as if we don't have the need for breaking stereotypes. His response to this argument is that affirmative action is not the way to do it, that it actually isn't effective at removing inaccurate stereotypes. In fact, he thinks if it's known that someone was hired based on an affirmative action hiring policy, then less respect will actually be given to them. That'll reinforce a stereotype that uh, people from this background actually need the help to be able to get the job or something like that. He uses these examples of uh, never go to a black physician under 40 or quotas cops, and not because he endorses those stereotypes, but that he's worried about uh, giving more fuel to the fire for them. And he thinks aff affirmative action backfires in its attempts here, in its ambitions here. Uh, okay, so that's how that argument goes. By the way, chat, feel free to jump in at any point. There's kind of like a lot of arguments coming in quick succession here. So I'm going to be kind of just cruising through them. And definitely let me know if you if you want to you know pump the brakes a little bit and get some more clarification on something. Okay, and then we have this interesting... Are we doing so far so good? Yeah, okay. Wonderful. Um, all right, so then we got this interesting argument about equal results. Um, so uh, Pozeman citing this other guy, Arthur, who says, seeing equal results provides a benchmark to gauge genuine equality. And what we might want to clarify here, what do we mean by genuine equality? Well, I think what the idea here would be the absence of forces of systemic inequality. So this is something I was kind of talking about in the last lecture a little bit, that there are um, concerns about how um, there are, are forces built into the way society functions that keep certain people out or that um, doesn't give them equal opportunity. Um, for example, like what if a company was only advertising their jobs to a certain demographic, something like that. Um, that might be um, a systemic thing, right? A sort of a policy or a general pattern of practice that reinforces inequality. And what Arthur's sort of thinking is that if we really believe that human nature is roughly identical, um, that these differences in race and sex and all the rest of it 
don't really mean a difference in terms of what people's potential are and what they can accomplish, um, then if we see uh, underrepresentation or overrepresentation based on percentages from a population in these certain jobs, um, then that's a sign that something goofy is happening, that there are these um, maybe hidden or less transparent forces of systemic inequality that are affecting that result. And Postman wants to reply to the logic of that argument, trying to basically um, debunk the idea that unequal results is a sign or is evidence of uh, an unequal system, right? Okay, so uh, the first thing he says, and, and we got to be really careful about this, he says there very well could be genetic differences between races and the sexes. I say genders here actually in the notes. I think he does too, but we probably want to clarify that to sex. Remember, sex and gender are two very, very different things. Um, gender is more of a social construct, and um, sex has also got some some uh, social construct elements to it, but is less about per the performance of a certain personality type and more about um, how we categorize what's going on with ourselves biologically. Um, at the kind of the root level, we can talk about uh, sex as ostensibly supposed to be set by things like your chromosomes, like X, 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 Y, some of the other ones too, because there are other ones. There are actually more than two sexes, but anyway. Um, so he thinks there might be uh, factors that are different on a genetic level between people like this. Um, and he thinks that maybe there, there's the possibility here that those innate differences could lead to over or under representation of certain demographics in certain walks of life. In, in other words, in certain professions and jobs and things like that, certain aspects of society, that those, <clears throat> those differences could make some people more qualified or less qualified for certain positions. So if we've got a meritocratic system going on, not necessarily some kind of like an equal, like something that's not equal opportunity, um, we still might see differences in representation, but that's not a sign that some injustice has taken place. Now, I think it is important to be careful about how Posman is making this argument to be charitable on his behalf. Like I'm saying, I don't agree with him, but I don't want to treat him fairly in terms of the arguments that he's providing. We might think about it like this. Um, even if the facts come out this way for humans, that, the, that these sorts of differences, like racial differences, are not that significant in terms of people's potential and whether they could become qualified for a certain job or not. Let, let's say that, that that's just the facts don't have, that we don't have any deep inequality there in terms of people's innate abilities based on their genetics. Okay, so let's grant that. It still would be relevant for Pojman to talk about this on kind of um, theoretical grounds, right? That it's, you can imagine uh, humans having a different evolutionary history or encountering a certain alien species that has different genetic background. Um, there, if we, like, let's say some aliens come to Earth and then they start living here on Earth with us. Let's say they, they're like, I'm just making this science fiction thing off the top of my head, but let's say some aliens, like, uh, were able to escape the destruction of their planet or something from a supernova or asteroid um, collision or something like that. And they come here and we're like, yeah, we'll share the planet with you. Sure. I'm sure a lot of people would not be down with that, but let's just say that they did. Um, and then they're trying to integrate into society. They might create some new jobs, but they also uh, might be trying to like work at McDonald's and do things like that too. Like they, that alien race might be um, more uh, adept at certain things and less adept at other things. So you might see that that alien race sort of integrates in certain sectors of society if we keep this meritocratic system of hiring practices. Um, and they that might not fit with the proportion of the alien population to the human population, right? So maybe Pojman's got a point here that um, in sort of diffusing the argument from Arthur that equal results um, or unequal results would be uh, an evidence of an unequal system, an unjust system. Okay. Um, and the other point that he makes, and I actually have some sympathy for this, is that the, the numbers objection, he says getting the numbers right doesn't really solve anything. We shouldn't use them as a criteria of success. So in other words, Postman's trying to criticize a ham-fisted version of affirmative action, which just says, well, as long as we've got the right proportion of people doing the jobs, then we're a just society. 
And that might overlook all of the real dangers of systemic inequality. We can't just shoehorn things to now say, oh, it's just because, look, the numbers are working out right. Um, and that's probably a pretty fair point, that if, if the real concern here is about the genuine equality, right, the absence of uh, forces of systemic inequality, then just the numbers game is probably not going to be sufficient for correcting that problem. Okay. The other thing he points out is that these differences can also be chalked up to differences of voluntary choices. Um, so it's not like we need to demand out of people a certain proportion of people from a demographic end up pursuing a certain career just because we need to make it fair and equal or something like that. Um, I think one thing that is uh, something Pojman doesn't say that I might throw in there that I think would be fair that would help support his position here is that it might be worth recognizing that in many cases, not exclusively, not generally, but at this point in our society, there's a lot of still separation of um, uh, people on ethnic lines, um, culturally and socially. That happens. Um, where America is the melting pot, right? But there's still ways in which there's a kind of seg forces of segregation that just sort of happen. <clears throat> Maybe not always forced, sometimes it's self-selected for, but that leads us to think that maybe there's going to be differences in culture. That people from different ethnic communities will have different values. That they might see certain things as um, more worth pursuing and other things as less worth pursuing. Um, some things as a higher priority for building out a vision of a, a happy life and other things not. And people need to have, uh, in a just society, we might say, that people need to have the freedom to be able to choose, you know, to the pursuit of happiness the way that they choose to, that they elect to, out of respect for people's autonomy. And that might mean that the numbers don't work out proportionately to um, certain sectors. Now, with, I think a lot of that depends on what kind of job we're talking about um, and whether there's any reason to think that that job is something that people would self-select into or out of. Um, I'll give you a really, really, like, example that hits really home for me in my profession as a philosopher. Um, for a long time, it's been kind of, I would say, a black mark on uh, the professional world of philosophy that we've had very um, under, we have had low numbers in terms of representation of women in the profession. That's changing, and it's that trend has been sort of moving closer to equality. But that's been a, an issue for a long time, and we're definitely not out of the woods on it yet. But sometimes, I and I do think that to be perfectly honest here, I'll keep the hat turned. Um, there are definitely reasons for this that are concerns of systemic inequality. Um, there are ways in which a sort of masculine culture has filtered into the culture of professional philosophy in some places more than others. Um, when I talk to my colleagues across the nation at different schools, I, I see very different things. And in some of those communities, some of those intellectual communities, um, the cultures are definitely primed more, uh, like, you know, in terms of setting up, like, where opportunities are, what it takes to be successful. They're primed more for masculine um, gender archetypes. And, um, you know, women can, can um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, um, perform masculine identities, and some of them do. In fact, a lot of um, of the early uh, uh, examples of people who are trying to like break the glass ceiling, um, women trying to break the glass ceiling in different um, professions, ended up taking on a lot of masculine personality traits in order to be able to compete, get jobs, and to integrate in that culture, in that world. And I don't think that's necessarily a good thing. Um, that 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 can be seen as a kind of um, inequality. Also, there are pre there are prejudices and stereotypes about it too that have um, made uh, people less inclined to think of women as the type of people who can be good philosophers. In fact, um, even to this day, even at Bellevue College, I have uh, experiences and evidence available to me, observations available to me that um, women philosophy professors don't get the same kind of assumption of respect as a philosopher as um, men do. And that can also be, a, you know, can happen on a case-by-case -case basis. Different people are different. They have different personalities. 
But there are there is trends like that. There are forces like that. However, another thing that I think puts that, uh, that's in balance with that to a certain extent, is, and this doesn't do anything to downplay those realities that need to be addressed, is how um, a lot of women who excel intellectually and can do uh, can compete for things like philosophy jobs and get into good philosophy schools and, and get that sort of stuff, a lot of them select for other lines of profession, um, especially things like politics and sociology. Um, those are two fields that have better representation of women than um, philosophy does uh, historically. Um, and I think part of that might be that, um, that that's a choice. And why would that, why do I think that? Um, I think it might be because those uh, professions maybe have more of, a, uh, they're seen as having a greater potential for making actual social change happen, right? Because they're focused directly on that. So uh, I, I sympathize with that. If I, I was a, oh no. Okay, I'm going to have to take a pause here and help my baby. Um, but I, I could see the, I could see the logic behind that, that like philosophy is a lot of theorizing without necessarily uh, the kind of uh, practical impact that you might hope for and so um, so yeah okay I'm gonna take a little break I'll be right back all right where was I um oh we were yeah we we're just finishing up the equal results argument okay so um, next argument compensation argument so this is the argument that um, this is the kind of thing that Hedinger was talking about that he was like I don't want to defend affirmative action on these grounds of saying that um, because there was this past injustice that took place, um, we need to kind of make it right with those people that were abused in the past, um, like the idea of reparations or something like that. Now, Pojman says this is probably the strongest argument for affirmative action, um, and I just say, what would Hedinger say to that? I mean, he's like, no, that's not the strongest one. In fact, um, if we attempted to justify it on those grounds, uh, affirmative action is way more open to objection. So I, I always thought that was kind of interesting about how deeply these two philosophers disagree about what is the strongest footing for defending affirmative action. I'm more inclined to trust the person who's actually trying to defend it than the person who isn't, but um, uh, yeah, I wish I wish Pochman had said a little bit more about why he thinks this is the strongest argument. Um, but he says that there's a couple potential problems with that line of reasoning. The first thing is that, and, and let's be, we got to be careful about this, but he says it's not clear if there's an identifiable harm or an identifiable perpetrator. What he is not trying to say is that these injustices of the past um, are maybe didn't happen. That is not what he is trying to say at all. What he's really uh, complaining about here is that it's really hard to quantify exactly what has happened. I mean, he uses this kind of case example of like, if I steal your car, then we know what we know what's at stake here. You're out of car, I took it, right? <laughs> it's pretty straightforward. And figuring out how to compensate for that injustice is relatively straightforward because it's very clear what exactly was the harm that was done and we can put a dollar value on it and all that kind of stuff. It's a lot harder to figure out I mean, in some ways, I would say, in, if I was speaking in Pozeman's shoes here, that when you look at it, like the historical injustice that's been done to some people just in America is like immeasurable. That it's, in, in terms of its, its gravity and weight, it's really hard to say like, yeah, we could stick a number on that. And yes, these are the people that we're going to take that money from or that are responsible for, for conducting those reparations. Um, that's the other harder thing to identify. Um, I, I definitely think that there's a little bit more room here than Pojman um, suggests for that. There's been a lot of research done on this topic, um, and specifically about how the United States government has been a part of this, um, especially with something I mentioned in a previous lecture, I think, about um, uh, zoning for neighborhoods and who can get loans for houses in certain neighborhoods. I mean, that's a lot easier to sort of pin down on who's at fault, right? And what kind of harm was done. So this this might not be quite as impossible as Pojman is making it out to be, but that is his complaint. That's his concern about this. That it's, it's not so straightforward um, in terms of figuring out what must be done. 
the other thing I would throw in here is that in many ways, the same thing can be said about the Holocaust, um, but Germany pays reparations on that, even though um, it's a little harder to kind of pin down just like just the 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 value involved is just immeasurable. It's immeasurable. Um, it's very hard to anticipate this. Um, but he also it makes another point, and I think Pochman might be on a little bit stronger footing here when he says it's not clear if affirmative action would be the appropriate way to conduct those reparations. Maybe those reparations should happen a little bit more like like a check, you know, something like that, like some money um, might be better than saying something like the way that society is going to try to right the wrong is by giving these jobs, right? That might be a little harder to justify. I think there needs to be something more here from Pojman, um to really flesh out what is the concern or the problem there about it. What would make uh, giving people job opportunities as inappropriate? I can definitely see a line of argument that would say, Hey, if the whole problem of the injustice, the systemic injustice, has been taking people's opportunities away from them, giving them the opportunities might be pretty commensurable. Um, but but that's that's what Postman says. Um, and then he says the, that even with the these sorts of um, moral claims that the compensation argument can make, it's not sufficient to justify affirmative action. So this is a little bit more like how Hedinger was saying, yeah, there's a point here, but it can be outweighed by other considerations. That's kind of what Hedinger is saying, or I'm sorry, Pojman, that um, there's an importance to hiring people who are qualified for the job. So like this is not um, to like take another social hit is not the way to right this other social wrong. Um, he thinks that there's this social expectations argument around meritocratic systems that affirmative action busts up you saw Hedinger talk about this when he talked about whether um, uh, the most qualified person um, is entitled to the job. That's the social expectations argument. And then you, Pojman also makes the argument about inefficiency, that if you hire less qualified people, then there's an efficiency hit. You also saw that in Hedinger too. But those are the things that Pojman's putting more moral weight on that, think, that he thinks um, sort of override or outweigh um, this concern about compensation. Um, the other thing he mentions is that um, in terms of figuring out uh, what people had taken away from them, it's very hard because of the kinds of injustices that were done, um, it's, it's really hard to tell like what would things have looked like had they been different, like if those injustices had not happened, where would we be? Um, so that's this kind of like a speculative counterfactual history concern that we can't like maybe get a, a sense of that. Um, again, I, I kind of think maybe we can do a little bit more than what Pojman thinks we can do. But but that's that argument. Okay. Then he makes a different type of argument about compensation. That um, the compensation should come. So this is kind of like a way of trying to answer his question about who should who should be conducting these reparations? Wh who should be paying for this, right? And this other argument that Pojman entertains from his opponents is saying that people who have innocently benefited from that past injustice are the ones that should be on the hook for the compensation. And the kind of uh, moral principle that Pojman puts into his opponent's mouth here is sort of like spell out the argument for that is this, I, this operative principle, as he puts it, that anyone who knowingly and willingly benefits from a wrong must help pay for that wrong. And <clears throat> um, Postman wants to use a kind of thought experiment to try to uh, figure this out. So um, to, or to, to kind of uh, challenge that principle as a general principle that we should be using for moral reasoning. Um, so you, he tells a story about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, this is not what actually happened, but he says, let's say that my parents, um, that Pojman's parents um, bought this like growth serum that was going to, you know, cause Louis Pojman to grow really, really tall. And Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's um, uh, parents stole it and then uh, gave it to their son. And now he's in the NBA because uh, he's taller and, and this sort of thing. So he would be an innocent, who, but he was benefiting from the injustice that the parents did. Um, I kind of used a similar scenario in my last lecture, and uh, Pojman wants to say, like, he's not owed anything, right? He's not entitled to whatever Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was able to do. 
as a result of getting that growth serum um, in an inappropriate manner. Um, there's no right to this. And, and it certainly seems weird, he says, if we use giving uh, Pojman, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's job in the NBA as the sort of way to compensate for this um, because he obviously cannot do the job as well, right? Pojman is not very, very tall. Um, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is, and height makes for a difference in basketball, right? So um, so that's how he tries to debunk that argument. That, And, and I think this is interesting. I, I wonder... Again, I don't, I don't want to just comment on every and every stint on every instance here, but I think it's important to ask the question to Pojman of like, well, what do you, what does he think should be the response? Like, does it matter at all if I recognize that I have these things in my life or I have these opportunities only because of, or maybe in maybe not only, but in large part because of past injustices? And what what way do I respond to my situation? in in a way that respects that reality i i think Pojman maybe doesn't give a positive answer to this and we might want one but he thinks that affirmative action is not going to be the way to do it then he talks about diversity the diversity argument um, that diversity is a quote important symbol and educative device in some ways it kind of goes back to the thing about um destroying stereotypes etc cetera, etc cetera. learning how to get along with each other um, cultural exchange, all that kind of stuff. And it's a it's a symbol of the values that we have as a society to have a, a community of diverse people working together in a company cooperatively with each other on a team. So there's value to that. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think, again, that Pojman thinks that this is useless. I mean, he does attack um, just diversity for diversity's sake. I think that's a straw man argument. I actually sympathize with that. Sometimes we can fetishize diversity a little bit instead of thinking about why we actually value it. Like what is the basis of its um, ethical and moral value? I think it does have value, but it's important to think critically about that, about um, what is it that matters here about it. Kind of like maybe the, um, the line Pojman was taking about just getting the numbers right doesn't do anything in terms of social justice. Um, you know, just having diversity doesn't make anything right. In fact, it gets commonly um, made fun of in things like movies, right? Where you've got like token characters that are just in there for diversity when the movie doesn't do anything meaningful with their characters. They're not deep characters. They don't make any influence in the plot or things like that. Um, and those might be right criticisms. It's making a show of diversity without the substance of it. But maybe that substance really matters. Um, but for Pojman's part, he thinks that sort of value is not adequate to justify overriding the sort of moral claim of merit and efficiency. That it is just to kind of um, operate under this meritocratic system and that uh, efficiency is something we should be concerned about too. Getting the best person for the job who can do the best job in that position is something that matters, uh, that society's got a, a vested interest in, uh, a stake in that. Um, he says a lot of times the benefits of diversity are frequently irrelevant to the job that's at hand. And then he makes this other point that there are other ways to learn about other cultures other than through these kinds of diversity hires. Um, and I think there's a question about that. I, I man, I, I just want to say so many things. I just, it's very hard for me to turn off my critical voice here. But yeah, this is, I promised I wouldn't do this and I'm starting, I'm, I'm tempted, I'm getting, I'm goading myself into it, maybe. It's worth asking the question about um, just in what way, substantially, could diversity in the workplace have this kind of positive benefit that we would hope for from diversity generally? I think that's a good question to ask. And then we've got this anti-meritocratic argument to justify reverse discrimination. And we saw this in Hedinger through the uh, entertaining of the argument that the most qualified person does not deserve the job. All right? Remember, Hendra was saying there's a lot of factors that influence why we have the qualifications that we do. The only ones that we could really be say, said to deserve are those things that are the result of our own effort, um, that we've put what we've put into it, and everything else, all the other circumstantial factors that we didn't have any control over, we don't deserve those things. Um, so there can't be a moral complaint here against affirmative action. And in fact, Henger says, 
if we're judging on merit alone based solely on what people's effort is then actually a lot of times it's the people that come from these disenfranchised backgrounds that are more deserving of the job than the people who are more qualified because they've had to do more work to get to that position now um Pojman wants to go after he actually sort of breaks down the argument and i'm actually going to bring it up on the screen here but he he says this and i'm, I'm worried about this as a possible straw man since no one deserves anything, society may use any criteria it pleases to distribute goods. That's kind of the main argument here. But he really breaks it down and tries to look at it here. And he wants to attack premise four. So premise four here says, if a person does not deserve what produces something, then they do not deserve its products. Okay, so if I don't deserve the things that put me in a position to develop myself to have these qualifications, then I don't deserve the qualifications themselves. That's where Pojman wants to go. I'm a little suspicious of the uh, first premise here that society may award jobs and positions as it sees fit as long as individuals have no claim to these positions. It sort of makes it arbitrary on society's part. A um, little concern about that. But this is how Pojman wants to go for it. And he uses an example of gifts. So if I'm gifted $100, well, I don't, I don't deserve it. It was just a gift. It was a free gift. But that doesn't mean that I'm not entitled to do what I want with that hundred dollars, and that if I use that hundred dollars to buy something that it's not mine, um, and that like society could take it away from me because like, hey, you didn't do anything to deserve this, so we can take it from you. Um, Pojan wants to say we deserve the fruits of our labor and conscious choices. And that sounds to me like the effort part that Henger's focusing on. But it's sort of like um, Pojman is like mixing them up together. Like that once I put my, my labor into this sort of thing, um, then even if there are other favorable circumstances, which I didn't deserve, that set me up in order for that to be effective or to make a certain result happen, um, then that uh, I don't deserve those things too. So that's his argument. He also uses another kind of reductio argument that says, well, if this is really true, um, if there, if for all the things that we don't deserve, society can use any criteria it wants to distribute goods, then that means social engineers can take my eyes and kidneys since I don't deserve them. Like, I didn't do anything to make sure that I have eyes and kidneys, so the social engineers can, like, steal them from me um, and use them for whatever purposes it wants. Of course, that's absurd, um, and that would be an immoral result. I, I think um, it's worth thinking about how the opponent can respond here. <clears throat> that... There are uh, maybe other principles that this social engineering is subject to. Um, basic considerations about justice. Uh, just because we're focused on one aspect of justice, this kind of egalitarian aspect of social justice, doesn't mean that all the other elements of justice fly out the window too. Um, so, so there's that. But that's, that's his argument. And then I say anything missing here to allude to how there could maybe be other arguments in defense of affirmative action that Pojman does not entertain. Um, <clears throat> if this was my on-campus class, I would ask for a, a class discussion a little bit, but I'm going to move things along um, uh, unless anyone in the chat wants to jump in on that. But also, maybe this is a good time to check in with the chat and see if you've got any questions about what we've been talking about so far. Nope. Okay. <clears throat> so Postman is saying that, uh, so the question is, is the diversity of working environments unjustifiable based on Postman? And Postman is saying, I think, that, yeah, there's some good to this, um, but it's not a big enough good that outweighs these concerns about uh, frustrating the meritocratic system that we operate under um, and the sort of... Uh, um, inefficiency costs that will happen if we fail to hire the most qualified employees. So it's not so much like diversity doesn't matter for Pojman as much as he kind of doesn't think it has as much value. It doesn't have um, as much weight as these other values that we're concerned about. I mean, if you wanted to ask him for an argument for that, that'd be absolutely fair. I mean, on what grounds 
do we want to start weighing these different moral values? Um, Hedinger tried to do this <clears throat> in his last two arguments that we talked about at the start of this lecture by using arguments from analogy to say, well, if we're cool with this, then we should be cool with this. Um, Pochman doesn't do that so much as sort of, he pronounces a little bit more than maybe he ought to argue. Um, but maybe we could also charitably try to put together some argument on his behalf for that. But that's the, that's the position that he's staking out. He's, he's not willing to pay the cost for it. That's That'd be a quick way to put it. All right, anything else? Okay. Um, in looking at Pochman's arguments, um, was there anything that you felt uh, should have been addressed that he didn't address in terms of ways that we could try to defend affirmative action? Like the positives that it, that it has going for it? No? You don't agree with the diversity of working environment argument? So you think diversity in the working environment is more valuable than Pojman gives it credit for? Oh, no, <clears throat> you think um, qualifications should be more valuable than diversity. Uh-huh, uh-huh, I see. So you do agree with him about that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I'll throw in this. I, I think one argument that could come up here is that um, – Giving a, a position like a job, especially a, a more advanced job, to someone who comes from a disenfranchised demographic is not only something that benefits them, um, but it sets up other opportunities for, like, say, their children. Um, not just in terms of economic advantages, like a higher paying job um, that can create a more stable home and this sort of stuff but also how it opens up other connections and opportunities and reputation can be a thing um, that uh, can can sort of open up the a different community to having access to a sector of society that they wouldn't have access to otherwise perhaps and i think that's also something that hedinger has in mind but i don't necessarily see that in pochman's um, analysis here but there's sort of like this this ripple effect that can happen going forward in time. It, it's not like it's just a handout or something, but it can have a long-standing repercussions this way. Um, uh, okay, <clears throat> well, let's, let's, uh, let's finish this off. Let's see if we can't get through all of these other arguments that uh, Pojman has in mind. These are his positive arguments against affirmative action, so the kinds of things that would be in the category of arguments that Hedinger was trying to address and debunk. There's some things here that don't show up in Hedinger, and there's some things that do. The first thing that Pojman says is that affirmative action requires discrimination against a different group. So affirmative action is discriminating against a new minority, innocent white males who are poor. Um, they're going to suffer the burden of affirmative action hiring policies. Um, he's already argued against the notion of compensation. Uh, he says this only shifts the injustice. It doesn't solve it. We kind of saw a little bit of this with Hedinger with the argument that um, affirmative action is doing the very thing that it's opposed to. And so I think you kind of need to square Pochman with Hedinger's arguments on this topic to kind of get that discussion going. Um, 
Postman does offer this new idea, though, that maybe we should focus on early development rather than the later hiring stages. And I've always found that students are very um, sympathetic with that. When I've taught this class in the past, they're like, oh, yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, that would solve so many problems. This isn't a problem for the business world. Um, let's push it off into earlier stages of development. But like I was just saying, this is kind of why I wanted to bring up that other potential argument in favor of affirmative action is that it can be kind of like a chicken and the egg sort of thing. That by the getting the jobs, that opens up other opportunities for future generations. That does set them up for success down the road. Um, <clears throat> but there could be, I mean, in, in some ways, I'm, I'm like, why not both and? That'd be nice. <laughs> right? Let's try to target this at every different level of society um, rather than just pushing off the burden for this issue of social justice onto only one group or only one sector. Um, the next argument that Posner makes is affirmative action perpetuates the victimization syndrome. Um, I had a lot of students talking to me about uh, the Kanye West stuff uh, over the last couple weeks. Um, in charity and fairness to Kanye, um, I think in some ways this was part of his what was motivating some of his comments um, that we that we might be able to see something for. Now he definitely expressed these ideas in a much more extreme way than Posner did, but there's sort of this this concern. And again, remember. Pojman is someone who was a civil rights activist. He's concerned about uh, creating a equal society. And I think he's a little concerned that um, a victimization syndrome is something that's another obstacle for this kind of progress. Um, he said he's worried about how affirmative action policies would encourage a message to minorities that more can be gained by emphasizing weakness rather than the strengths of discipline and hard work and this kind of thing. Um, and it encourages a message to the rest of society that minorities can't make it on their own, like we talked about earlier with the reinforcing of stereotypes, that, that concern that Pojman has. Um, so he thinks, you know, he, the strongest language that Pojman uses, which is a little similar to some stuff Kanye said, is that um, this would allow, th this, that affirmative action would perpetuate wounds of oppression further into the future than they should be allowed to go. Uh, so again, this is remember that this is a disagreement between people who both care about a lot of the same social justice values, and they just disagree about what tactic is going to be effective at doing this. This, is, this would be one of the points of disagreement on that, of like, can affirmative action actually ha help? And uh, Pojman's saying it doesn't help, and it can actually hurt. Okay? And similar to this, he says it encourages mediocrity and incompetence. Um, I'm really not sure what to present here as Pojman's argument. This is one of the things I was alluding to earlier is like, I don't think it's exactly clear what is the point. Um, there's a lot of anecdotal stories in this section um, that don't, um, I think Pojman is taking for granted an interpretation about them in terms of how they are mobilized into an argument. But this is, this is my best attempt to reconstruct it. I think maybe Pojman is thinking affirmative action um, doesn't justify these idiotic decisions or beliefs that people have exhibited, um, but it does maybe create the opportunity of risk of people doing idiotic things like that, that it like might serve to rationalize some stuff. Kind of the way that I was worried, like, you know, there's some things that are happening in Pojman <clears throat> that I'm a little concerned. I, I don't think he's insincere, but I could imagine some insincere people using Pojman's arguments as rationalizations for a position that wouldn't be justified. Um, this might be a similar type of concern that Pojman has about affirmative action. Um, so that's that's another that's my best attempt to handle this section. I mean, a lot of the things that he uh, brings up are just just strawmen, just like bad examples of affirmative action in practice. Um, just because we think, like, let's say, let's just grant for the sake of argument, affirmative action is morally justified. There's a legitimate moral basis for it. There's still ways that we could screw it up. There's a way we could do it badly. Um, take something like, um, like some people have been pros proposing some, some more extreme or at least extreme for the existing system. Things like, um, uh, a, um, what's the word? Um, oh, I just had it and then I lost it. Uh, universal basic income or single payer healthcare. I mean, those are real options. Um, and they might, they have a lot of good arguments on behalf of them. Can we imagine versions of them that are just totally dysfunctional? Yeah. And sometimes the people who are opposed to those suggestions only present these sort of really weak straw man versions of them. And that's what I'm kind of worried about here too. But I, I think 
If Poachman's on his best footing here, that still makes these <clears throat> anecdotal situations relevant to an argument that is not a straw man. <clears throat> this is this would be my charitable reconstruction of it, that it might encourage these inappropriate ways of um, of uh, actually putting affirmative action into practice. That maybe when people are using it in the business world, they won't be as careful as a philosopher like Hedinger in terms of how they're thinking about it. And then the next argument here uh, that Pojman complains about with affirmative action is that it unjustly shifts the burden of proof. Now he's talking a little bit more about the law here. And uh, he's worried about this sort of guilty until proven innocent thing if we were using affirmative action hiring policies on a quota system, especially if it was legally mandated. Now that hasn't been, that is not on the table. Um, the government has only done these sorts of things with projects that it is uh, directly funding. That's, we have some precedence of that historically. Certain public works projects and stuff like that. Um, but that's different from something like a government mandate to all businesses that then could be actionable about. Now there is a certain um, <clears throat> reason or motivation for trying to put more legal pressure on the employer rather than the employee. Um, and that's because it's really hard to um, actually enforce this Title VII from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which makes uh, hiring discrimination illegal. So like um, not hiring someone because they're black or a woman or something like that. That's, that's actually, that is illegal. We're not talking about affirmative action policies here. We're talking about um, positive, uh, like traditional discrimination. That is illegal, but it's really hard to enforce. So there's been a push. Uh, it's it's really easy for uh, employers to be to have this presumption of innocence. It's like prove it, prove that we're racist, right? <laughs> That's really 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 hard to do, except in the most blatant of circumstances. Um, the the figuring out who is the most qualified person for a job is somewhat subjective. Uh, and sometimes people make hiring decisions not on that basis. And to show that there's any kind of racial or sex, sex, sexist animus behind it uh, is really, really hard to prove. So there's been some pressure to kind of like shift the legal weighting here so that there's more of the need for an employer to prove that they're not doing that than to be proven that they're guilty of this sort of thing. Um, but uh, Pojman complains about that and thinks that betrays some of our principles about rights under the legal system that we have in America. Okay, and then we get to the argument from merit. And this has been the kind of core thing that's been looming around the whole rest of it for, for Pojman. Um, Pojman thinks rewarding excellence is both just and efficient. So there's a lot of um, appeal from Pojman in this section on just a prima facie argument based on intuition that we sort of have strong intuitions that merit should be rewarded and that's what I mean to talk about this meritocratic system if it's got a moral basis to it it might just be that we think people who have developed themselves into being the best should be rewarded for that they like the and again we might be careful here following Deska about sports metaphors in the business world but you know when you're talking about the competition of sports we're like you give the trophy to the team that won not <laughs> the teams that didn't win you give it to the winner and you might say the same thing about the business world and the sort of competitive culture that's involved in capitalism um, that it's right for this to happen this way um, because it's rewarding excellence um, and that's just a matter of justice maybe all on its own um, that's what Pojman is proposing to us. I think that needs to be interrogated a little bit more. We, sh we should ask for an argument here. And then he also says, and it'll also maximize good consequences. You put the best people in the job, they're going to do the best work. We're all going to benefit from that. And there is this analogy with sports <laughs> that, that Pojman brings up. And he's like, if it works in sports, it should work in business. Deska might have some complaints about that, but there's that. Then um, how are we doing so far in the chat? I've been kind of cruising through these. I'm trying to get this lecture done in a timely fashion. How are you doing? Not been going too fast? We're doing okay? Any questions? Is merit-based employment consistent with the rule of utilitarianism? 
That's really interesting. So um, certainly conceiving it as a matter of justice, like if we think people who do excellent things should be rewarded and people who do substandard things, or maybe we might say bad things, should be punished. I mean, that is not in utilitarianism. Remember our little treatment of utilitarianism? Mill went out of his way to try to deal with the opponent of justice, and this would fit in there. However, um, utilitarians might be impressed by the argument that um, rewarding excellence creates an incentive for doing better that will produce more good consequences. So that kind of system might be the way to maximize utility. Not because it's something that merit is something of intrinsic moral worth, but it might have this mechanism of maximizing overall good consequences. Does that, does that make sense? So utilitarianism will like the appeal to efficiency that Posman's making, but not so much this idea of just uh, um, merit as a, a, a value of justice in itself. But we have a lot of those intuitions, right? Like, if you do good work, you expect to be rewarded, and you think it would be right for you to be rewarded for that. Um, if you don't go, do good work, you're like, well, I didn't do good work, so I didn't deserve the reward. That kind of thinking is what Pojman is also appealing to, and utilitarianism wouldn't be down with that. Not directly. Indirectly, yes, but not directly. Okay, two more arguments to get through. One we can do really fast, because <laughs> it's, it's a classic in moral debates, and that's this uh, slippery slope argument. So um, Pojman asks, what are the limits on affirmative action? Um, is this going to involve an unfair stigma on young white males who are the least guilty in his opinion? They haven't done anything to participate in systematic injustice or anything like that, like we talked about before with Hedinger's arguments. Um, but it's sort of like if we're in this sort of inequality over here and affirmative action is trying to like push the needle back to a state of equality, well, if it keeps going, it'll push in the opposite direction. And then we'll have we'll need to have affirmative action policies going the other direction. Pojman says, like, it's madness. Now, slippery slope arguments uh, should always be looked on with a certain amount of suspicion <laughs> because sometimes they get used inappropriately. Um, I would say there, there's also a danger of straw manning here. Most people like Hedinger that defend affirmative action think of this as only contingently justified. It's uh, If we're in a state of equality, then there's no need for it. And then you, you kind of like use it to climb up the ladder and then you kick the ladder away. You don't need it anymore once you've gotten where you need to go. Um, so there's a kind of expiration date on these things. Once they've done their job, we don't need them anymore. So that might be where the limit is. Right? That's, where, that's what would block the slippery slope. Not too much more to say about that. The last argument, though, is a little little more in depth here. So, <clears throat> and this is this is really interesting. Might be something to this. We also got to be careful about it. Um, I think. So there's this guy Sowell who did this research, and he and Pojman is saying that there's this mounting evidence against the success of affirmative action that it doesn't actually produce the desired result. The thing that we're hoping for it to do doesn't it doesn't work that way. So. Sowell finds that there are huge disparities between demographics on the SAT. Um, I'm not sure what that's supposed to prove all by itself. This is another case of like some uncertainty, lack of clarity in what argument is actually being offered. But there is an argument here that I think does make sense and does come out pretty clearly. Um, that what happens is, uh, and he's talking only about affirmative action here in schools for like admissions into getting into certain schools, colleges, and universities. But we definitely could, we could think about this uh, phenomenon taking place in the business world too. But the idea is that you're sort of punching above your weight class. Um, that affirmative action allows you to get into positions that you might not actually be prepared for. Um, that it uh, sets you up into higher expectations that then um, cause people to kind of burn out and drop out. And in that way, affirmative action might actually have harmed them. So Pojman says preferential admissions policies, like affirmative action admissions policies in schools, have led to high attrition rates and substandard performances for those preferred students, people who came from those disenfranchised demographics that the affirmative action uh, selection was pri uh, privileging. Um, for those, uh, so substandard performances for those students who survived to graduate. Um, so it's not really helping those people, um, those people who get that opportunity. 
um, it's not like you get the opportunity, then boom, success. You might be put set up. It might be like you're setting them up to fail, kind of thing. That might be a way to put the the sentiment on Posman's part here. And then he also makes this point that affirmative action policies, sort of st statistically, as we've done them in the past, seem to benefit more upper class families that come from these disenfranchised backgrounds rather than the ones that come from middle or lower class. And this might also go back to an argument we brought up with Hedinger that maybe um, cl a, a sort of class sensitivity would be appropriate for thinking about these um, these priorities about how to for hiring selective hiring practices or for admissions to colleges things like that 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 might be a better variable to put some more weight onto or to introduce that into the calculus here too um, and then um, he kind of en Pojman ends with this kind of quote of like it's foolish to expect equal results when we begin with grossly unequal starting points and that is Pojman sort of acknowledging the reality of inequality that is in our society. Again, because he thinks that is something morally relevant. He's just saying we're not going to be able to get equal results this way. Um, again, you might say uh, Pojman is sort of playing the patience game and saying we've got to we've got to make this happen. And I think it's fair to ask what would Hedinger say to that. Uh, it's also fair to ask Pojman for what's his plan. How are we going to be able to do this? What does he see as the obstacles for us getting to this future of equality? And I, I think that's kind of where this needs to go. I mean, at least affirmative action is, is offering a positive proposal here. And I think that's one reason to, to take it seriously and to give it a shot, um, uh, to treat it with some charity here. That's kind of some of my two cents on it. Um, but there is a question of here if we um, – yeah, I'll keep, I'll keep my hat turned for this. Um, if we do care about social justice, we do care about equality in society, um, that is a value that we have, um, can we just kind of wait for nature to run its course sort of thing? Will time march forward and this uh, direction of progressiveness will just keep going, uh, that we don't have to push it along in any kind of way? Um, I'm a little skeptical about that. I'm not sure if that is humanity's natural momentum. Um, I'm kind of worried it might the natural momentum might be in the other direction and that we we could uh, have our development stop and maybe regress too that I think these things are possible so it's worth if, if we really care about these values then we have to take stock of like what are the obstacles to them and what are our options and it might be that an imperfect option is better than no option um, but or, or maybe find ways to respect the concerns that Pojman is raising and ask ourselves, yeah, is there a way we can do this better? Maybe not throw out the whole plan, but maybe modify it in a way that can dodge some of these moral concerns that he's raised. So that's kind of my, my little two cents on that um, in sort of uh, closing the book here on the affirmative action topic. Um, when we get together on uh, Thursday's lecture, we're going to pick up a new topic, this topic of international business. And this is the long-awaited promised discussion where we're going to reintroduce the conversation around moral relativism. Uh, by the way, oh, before I forget, code word, tonight is going to be garlic. I am looking forward to some garlic in my meal to come here. Uh, so how about garlic is our code word, not something fancy tonight. Just keep it simple. Yeah, garlic. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, we'll be doing um, moral relativism, cultural differences, multinational, international corporations, and ethical standards that differ from culture to culture, and how is that relevant for our thinking about uh, business ethics more generally. So I'm very excited for that conversation, too. I think it's going to be a good one. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what you think about it, too, on the message boards. I've been a little backed up on, on catching up on some of that grading because I've been preparing for this big campus talk I'm giving tomorrow. But after that gets done tomorrow, then I'll um, be catching up again on that. Um, and keep, keep in contact with me about talking about papers, paper ideas, and all that good stuff, too. We've got a little less than three weeks now, uh, so um, let me know about what you're thinking about. Definitely don't procrastinate. I want to do everything in my power to encourage you not to do that just because I want this to be a good experience for you, and I, I think um, procrastination will not serve you in that regard. So, And I want to be a support, I, and the more time we've got to talk about it, the more support I can offer. So um, rope me in on it and, and let me be a part of it with you. But good luck with it, and I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs>